ministre d'État, je voudrais vous présenter mes respects, Monsieur le professeur Peter Piotr, co-président de cette session. Mesdames et Messieurs les membres du... Uh, I would like to... Ladies and gentlemen, members of the scientific committee, members of the panel, dear participants, I'm indeed very happy to take part in this uh, Galen Africa Forum, a meeting which has indeed become part of Africa's agenda in this area. I would like to express my apologies to the Minister of Health and uh, Social Action. Professor, we are very happy to have you amongst us, and I would like to express satisfaction with the fact that uh, the forum is presided over by the President of the Republic of uh, Senegal. The health crisis, the current health crisis uh, linked to COVID-19 has indeed uh, guided the theme for this uh, forum. It led to the choice of that theme uh, for our meeting. The COVID-19 pandemic, which is affecting the entire world for close to a year, has indeed uh, consequences on the social, economic, and cultural and scientific uh, spheres of our country. In Africa, no country was spared, even though the continent did not have as many cases as uh, some uh, anticipated. There are questions which come up. Are we very ready? What has been the level of mobilization of the stakeholders, the community stakeholders? Traditional medicine, which is very present in the continent, has it really played any role in the fight against uh, the pandemic? What is the role of the community in this uh, fight? To ensure that uh, drugs are placed at the uh, disposal of people in all the different parts of the country. These are the different uh, themes which we are going to deal with uh, in this panel, that is multi-sectoral uh, participation, the strength and weaknesses of uh, recommendations, the contribution of uh, traditional medicine in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic, the current situation, the uh, prospects, the provision of uh, drugs in Africa, and uh, challenges and perspectives. These are the different themes which we will be dealing with. And in all, we'll have two members of the panel who would speak successively, and they will each be given five minutes. To start, uh, they'll have to share their experiences Nous avons, uh, on this uh, subject, and uh, there's also a former patient who, uh, a former minister of Senegal, who also had uh, the uh, virus and who is today cured, will testify during this uh, during this uh, session. We'll be told how he experienced the uh, illness. There will be other speakers, of course, and after their communication, we'll hold discussions for 30 minutes. And uh, I am indeed pleased to be the moderator for this uh, session with Professor. Now, let me introduce the first speaker. Madam Yasin Jibo, who is the executive director of Speak of Africa. Madam, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good afternoon to you all. It is indeed a pleasure for me to be here today and to share my experiences in relation to this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And this is a multi-sectoral participation. Uh, 
autour des différentes thématiques. The interpreter has problems during the speaker, notably in the field of uh, health and sensitization. So we are working in a very friendly environment, which makes it possible for us to do our job appropriately. We have gone to different parts of the countryside and uh, we try to work with partners. And in particular, at, in Senegal, as some years ago, we saw this type of commitment within the framework uh, in the fight against uh, malaria. And uh, we try to ensure that everybody could be put on board in the fight against the uh, pandemic. There are three pillars, the public, private sector, and the communal uh, level. And today, this campaign, this campaign is indeed launched in seven countries across the African continent. And it is indeed a campaign which started in one country at the communal level and which has spread to other parts of the continent. When we look at the uh, success of this campaign, we notice that it is indeed uh, the, a there's a strong commitment uh, of the political leaders and uh, at the communal level. And we have champions like Elaji Job and uh, others who he, he lost his daughter to uh, malaria and uh, he, today he works in that fight. So in response to the COVID-19 pandemic in Africa, we've been able to start uh, a campaign remain uh, remain careful with different uh, partners, including the African Football Confederation and uh, Special Olympics. And Comment est-ce qu'on pouvait combattre la mésinformation, mais également pouvoir We work with them at the national level, and uh, we provide training. And within the framework of this uh, campaign, we have come up with several initiatives notably an initiative which consists in setting up uh, uh, hand washing machines in schools in Senegal, but also to focus on platforms at the level of the African Football Confederation to use footballers to spread the message to all the population. Uh, and that is, is in a bit to make them have the information. And uh, we talk to them about the behavior to adopt. We work with those different uh, partners. And uh, we try to see which policies should be adopted. We think of the needs for funding, uh, funding and how we can work together to indeed respond effectively to the pandemic. pouvoir mettre à disposition cette plateforme qui permet justement de le faire. Et peut-être juste un dernier point par rapport aux différents... We have slightly speaker of with network problems. But under, to be, we are trying to train participants. We had the opportunity during the pre-forum of the youth to start to, to, to launch a new prize or for new African innovators on health and uh, we did so in uh, partnership with Ishma. And we believe that through this pride, prize, we could encourage innovation amongst the youth. And uh, we could see how we could work with our young scientists to uh, find solutions to this uh, problem which we face today and to improve uh, treatment. In a nutshell, that is what I wanted to share with you in regard to our treatment within the framework of this uh, pandemic COVID-19. And uh, I hope that uh, this will come to an end very quickly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Kibo. And uh, now it is my turn to introduce the next speaker. And I'd like to pay tribute to Madam Minister of State. And uh, I'd like to congratulate her for the Galian Forum but uh, there were earlier speakers like the group of women and uh, all those who have participated. Now, it is indeed an honor and pleasure for me to introduce one of the great 
anthropologists and sociologists in, in the health field in Africa, Professor Sheikh Ibrahima Nyang, with whom I've had the opportunity to work on several occasions to work on HIV AIDS and uh, also in the social context. This professor, sociologist, anthropologist, is uh, well known not only in Africa, but uh, all over the world, Senegal and other African countries. Uh, you have helped them in, the, in, uh, in the fight against COVID-19. Can you share with us the strengths and weaknesses, and especially your recommendations for the future? If possible, can you do all of that in five minutes? Professor, you have the floor and thank you very much. Unmute your microphone, sir. Kindly unmute your microphone, Professor. If uh, Professor Nyang is not online, but we can see him, we can see him. Yes, he is online, we can see him. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for this uh, kind words towards me. Well, my real constraint now will be time, as you must be aware, I'm really talkative. But I'll try to speak to one of the main axes, which I think is philosophy, uh, philosophical. There is really no epidemic in the world which can be solved without involving without the participation without awareness of the population it is declared in the community and it has to be dealt with by the community so if there is resistance if the community does not really uh, work in the fight against the pandemic then there will be no response to the pandemic now how has Africa succeeded with uh, very good results in spite of uh, its, uh, its problems. I think this is not an accident. I'm talking about the principle that there was indeed communal response in Africa. There was communal commitment. There was communal resilience. And there are billions of micro processes which can be explained. So, given that uh, there was increased resistance, we must know that this leads to vulnerability for communities. And it also weakens the communities. This is to say, why did we not have so much resistance in Africa, and the Africans decided to go in and to produce solutions to this problem. Let me try to summarize everything. Indeed, there was something before COVID. Before COVID, the WHO Afro made a considerable contribution by preparing communication at the communal level. Works were carried out training, capacity building was conducted involving different uh, services, and it was a multi-sectoral approach. And this multi-sectoral approach in the framework of the preparation of a response in emergency situation is already known to Africans. So what did Africa do specifically which led to the fact that uh, this, uh, this multi-sectoral approach was successful that more than in other continents. It is the contextualization of this multi-sectoral approach by 
invoking the cultural dimension, the anthropological dimension, which also is the fact that one, there was also the fight of this, uh, uh, the fight against this uh, uh, pandemic, which consisted in the relationship, the gender relationship, because women are at the center in the fight uh, against uh, diseases. So the response became strengthened in the society thanks to the contribution of women, and as well as the cultural resources and the, lo uh, the, 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 the local conception in the fight against uh, the pandemic. So what came before Corona in matters of uh, communication in uh, communal uh, communication must be explained. And secondly, the communal dynamism and the communal responses in uh, emergency situations, because when the first cases of communal transmission when the first cases were identified in Senegal, it was sociologists, anthropologists, and uh, social scientists, researchers who comblaient the gap des réponses institutionnelles au niveau de la ville de Touba. Le, 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 ceci amène à formuler la recommandation de former, de, 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 de former et de doter en capacité des équipes mobiles et rapides. Okay, he says, come back. So this anthropologist indeed acted promptly and this contributed in the fight against uh, the pandemic. Now, how did the people work? Now let's begin with their, uh, their capacity to listen. At times the society is too authoritative, too paternalistic and uh, could itself generate uh, resistance or even revolt in the community because the community feels that uh, they have been uh, affected somehow and their traditions have not been respected. So this work of communication is fundamental in Africa. And I think for this COVID case, the, those in charge of communication very quickly went into work and that was extremely important. And this uh, could be considered as uh, one of uh, the achievements. Uh, and there somewhere else they have to work like uh, and work in an anthill and work round the clock. And finally, at the communal level, how are decisions made? So there are religious aspects which must be taken into uh, consideration. The associations which must be taken into uh, consideration. Network for women and others in uh, the countryside. How do we listen to them? How do we uh, get in touch with them? And so we came up with a strategy to respond. And that way, uh, all of this became very important in the response. And this gives the response a human face. So this was a case uh, in all the emergency cases at the initial stage. So when the initial cases uh, started, this uh, response was uh, activated and there was the issue of stigmatization those who are uh, uh, sick uh, so there was a need indeed to have empathy towards people who are sick from the cultural perspective and that is indeed very important to deal with the pandemic the second aspect which is also very important which should be taken into consideration is information if there's no information there should be there will be a problem there should be continuous information and uh, traditionally we call it research and action so this is research which is traditional and it tries to articulate very quickly the communal action and at that level also there are interesting experiences in Dakar and uh, we uh, succeeded with a new cartography for those who have to participate in this fight the stakeholders and local initiatives were taken on board and uh, there were frameworks to listen for consultation and co-construction at the district level with communal leaders 
and uh, all the different networks, including subversive networks, subversive because they question uh, this the, 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 the approach and the work in complicity with different uh, movements. So we work with all of them to ensure that uh, this uh, will lead to collective decisions. Now, this informative research must be documented. I think you'll have to round up. Yes, yes, I'm going to round up. And lastly, lastly, this Senegalese experience shows the birth of a new source of information that is traditional classical information where you have several sources which come together to constitute a source of information at times uh, people say the community already knows so how could we channel this information through more active information and go beyond what the uh, community already knows so that they'll be able to acquire information so we could have daily information we should we were able to train more than 100 uh, uh, students at volunteers, uh, 1,200 uh, trainers in districts were trained, and over 12,000 volunteers in different districts were trained. They come to listen, they construct, and they follow the responses which are given at the level of uh, communities, because the battle is indeed at the level of uh, the communities. Now, let's look at the weaknesses and the current situation. What can we recommend? I don't know. Perhaps there's a link between ecology and this uh, this uh, pandemic, but I want to notice that uh, during the cold seasons, uh, this uh, pandemic is uh, greater. And uh, so it leads to a change in behavior. This change in behavior could indeed uh, constitute uh, areas of vulnerability. So what should we do in regard to change of uh, change of behavior related to change of uh, uh, climate? Now, the whole entire situation, what do we do indoors? What do we do in homes? What do we do in our rooms? What do we do in the palace when we watch TV? Uh, to spend time because it is not uh, possible to go out. So what is the culture which indeed uh, develops during this uh, uh, pandemic? There also there are some uh, responses which we can identify and which could be translated precisely and which you could uh, benefit from. Now, looking at the cultural ecological aspect, that's internal ecology, in this relationship, this cultural ecological relationship, there's also the woman, for instance, some who are the custodians of health and uh, behaviors in the society. The times are changing. So what should we do? What tools could we use to ensure that women can take leadership in the fight against this second wave? Uh, second wave? Because this second wave is indeed a very serious beat in the United States or anywhere else in the world or in Africa. It is indeed a serious case because many other countries could indeed uh, face the risk. And especially we have learned that the health structures themselves could indeed lead to stigmatization. So how can we introduce philosophical, conceptual changes and structural changes to reduce stigmatization in the health system to develop empathy, recognition of the other and uh, equality? Because these are all African concepts which are very important here. So we should be able to respect the dignity of the others, and uh, it is part of health. And it, so when we explain dignity in terms of health, this will enable us to face uh, uh, the situation in health centers and in other parts of uh, the community, because there are too many cases. So in relation to all that, what can we do at home in regard to treatment and uh, care? How can we prepare? There should be social and cultural preparation and uh, the experience of Senegal could indeed enable us to draw some lessons and which could be updated. So the major problem which we'll face is that of the vaccines. The vaccines could also be a cultural uh, object. So if the vaccine has to face a culture, to, it has to face a history and uh, a heritage. We are in a 
situation of dangerous political context. And there's an adage which says that when two elephants fight, it's a grass that will suffer. So when the political context is uh, bleak, when there is no uh, danger for policies to be accepted, then social science research will be affected and the credibility of uh, communal engagement will be questioned. So what can we do at that level? We should be able to listen more. We should be able to promote the sacerdotal concept, the religious concept at the political level. Because I've, I'm, I'm rounding up and at the political and economic levels, to some it is considered as business so, so there's a fight against corona business and the fight against corona business will indeed affect the possibility of a response and then all the recommendations concerning transparency in management uh, community control and uh, continuity because it is a participation of the state in communal activity that should constitute the leadership uh, and uh, in a nutshell, that is what I wanted to share with you. And I'm at your disposal for any questions. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. It is indeed interesting, but unfortunately, uh, time was not on our side and we have to manage it. Now, I'm going to introduce Professor Francis Omaswa. Professor, you are the executive director of Stan Africa for the World Health, and you are also the winner of the Nagushu Prize for 2019. I want to congratulate you for being uh, winning that distinction. Professor, what is was the role of your institution in Uganda in strengthening the multi-sectoral uh, participation in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic? Professor, you have the floor. Good. There's a lot of rain here and uh, may um, affect the audibility of my presentation. Uh, so um, it's a, a pleasure to meet up with the uh, old colleagues, uh, Peter Pio and uh, also uh, Sheikh Ibrahim there. I know him from previous uh, uh, meetings. And I'm going to share with you briefly our experience here in Uganda with respect to uh, the role of community engagement in um, uh, our COVID response. The Oh. Well, I will share with you a bit about health. This is for the, the population, not you people. You are already familiar with this, but I will spend most of the time in describing our strategy here in Uganda and conclude by uh, suggesting what we in Africa can do uh, uh, as lessons from this experience in Uganda. So this message is familiar. In our health definition of the constitution of WHO, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, it is not about illness alone. It is about well-being. It's about social welfare. It's about security. It's about peace of mind. So uh, uh, that message, I don't need to spend much time with you. And then this is the message here on which our strategy is based, comes from uh, Alma Atta. Basically, the people must be empowered. They must be encouraged. They must be supported to play a role as a duty as well as a right to create their health with the resources that they have at the material time. And uh, this uh, is a quotation uh, some many years ago, Peter Piot knows, 
I was the Director General of uh, Health Services in the Ministry of Health. And this statement played on the radio many times a day for five or six years that health is made at home and only repaired in health facilities after it has broken down. People should be hygiene and nutrition and uh, 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 making sure that their homes are neat and clean. Uh, so uh, this, this is the message of community engagement, the role of communities. So this is a, a very important background message. Most of us are born healthy, and the French physiologist Claude Bernard talked about, told us about the internal environment, which really is very well regulated, so that if you obey your body, you should be able to live without needing health care for very extended periods of time. And this message needs to get to the population, needs to get to everyone, and it is the foundation of SDG 3. But there has to be a partnership between individuals, their health systems, and their governments. Individuals with the primary responsibility for maintaining their own health, that of their families and people they care for, the health system giving them knowledge which they need, and laws which enable people to behave right, government ensuring there is safe food, clean water, housing, law and order, so that people can get around their jobs. But remember, remember, remember that it starts with the individual having personal responsibility for their health. So uh, uh, to me, engagement of communities is what we are, pre you know, something we are pretending. We know that it's important, but we are doing nothing about it, or we are not doing enough about it. And uh, we are lecturing to the populations, COVID, wash your hands, and social distancing, and so on. But we are not asking the people their own views about the challenges that they face. Where do they get the water from for washing hands? And the soap, the struggles they have with the stigma, and so on. The people are being lectured to, they are being told what to do, but they are not being asked what they can do about it themselves. All those issues now which have emerged, I think the whole of, the whole of Africa is seeing this uh, with lockdown, teenage pregnancies, gender-based violence, and so on. So this message is important. We need to engage the people, not to lecture to them about things which they can handle themselves. So again, you know, this no one argues about this. The African Union Health Strategy, it calls for vibrant ways of living communities and so on. Uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Dr. Tedros is always saying, you know, people-centered is the way to, for, uh, that, uh, for, for universal health coverage. This is a friend of mine, the third bullet there, uh, Professor Miriam Were from Kenya. She says that, if health development does not happen in African communities, it will not happen in African nations. And you can find this uh, statement in a book we have uh, uh, written and edited with Lord Nigel Crisp called African Leaders Making Change and Claiming the Future, of, uh, chapter eight. So all this is okay, no one disagrees with it, but we are not doing enough about this. And that is the problem, and that is what we are going to talk about. So here is Uganda with COVID. We are now in phase four. This COVID is in the communities. We are not testing enough. We don't know enough about the, the state of the problem here, but we know that it's there because prominent people are contracting COVID and they are dying from it. We know that our health facilities are very stressed because of handling COVID patients. The solution, therefore, is to hand responsibility to the people so that they can handle uh, the prevention and care themselves. So that strategy has been uh, promulgated, directed by the president of Uganda himself, and these are the elements, the key elements of this strategy. So the key objective, to make all the people in Uganda aware, make them empowered, 
and they are participating themselves in the control of uh, COVID-19 as a duty, as a right, but above all, using the existing systems, governance systems and the resources that they have, because there is no time to, to wait. Then it, it, it's also the guiding principle is that uh, uh, empowering individuals and communities, good health starts with people. I've made this point already. I will not dwell so much more on it. And it's only supported where necessary by, by uh, the health professional skills and, 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 the, and equipment. But the primary responsibility remains with individuals and communities. And our strategy here is to use existing systems, existing structures. I will show them to you in a moment. Which should be able to, uh, uh, to help people reduce infections or uh, identify uh, infections properly, early, uh, uh, send for testing, rehabilitate those who come back after they have recovered from uh, the disease outside their communities. And we are recommending intersectoral collaboration, the whole of society approach. As you will see in a moment, that the structures we are creating are intersectoral because this is the this epidemics occur where people and how people live. So we bring in all key players of government, uh, and, and uh, it, it is uh, going to end up with a strong uh, 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 people-centered primary health care long beyond COVID with huge financial and economic returns for the health system here, if it works. So that is the link between the community engagement structure and the governance system in Uganda. At the very bottom there, there is a, a, a structure called local council. Every village has a committee chaired by a chairperson whom they elect themselves and a committee of nine people, a secretary for women and children, secretary for security, a secretary for, for production, agriculture, and so on. So there, they are what is called village health teams, which are basically community health workers who are in the community. Up to now, they have been volunteers. They get allowances from time to time when there's an immunization campaign and so on. Uh, then we uh, have, these are the, 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 the duties and the structures which we have uh, uh, included in our strategy. The, every village will have a COVID task force and it is led by the political leader of the village. It has got those commit individuals whom I have told you about, uh, uh, including other sectors, community development, religious leaders, cultural leaders, as representatives of the schools, if the school is there, and health facilities, and also uh, civil society organizations and the private sector. And their role is to undertake co co community-based surveillance and case detection, community case management, contact tracing, shielding the vulnerable, uh, and, uh, 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 and above all, maintaining a village health register. These people village visit five to 10 homes every day, and they keep a record. You know, the head of this home is called Omaswa. Does he have high blood pressure? Is he diabetic? What are his vulnerabilities? His wife is so-and-so. Is she attending a, 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 a family planning? Is she pregnant? Where is she going to deliver? So all that are kept in a register by the community health worker in the village who uh, is receiving facilitation uh, allowance from the government to do that work. They get about, I think, $30, equivalent of 30 US dollars. This came about uh, because already before COVID, my organization, and Peter Piot uh, is, knows about Archest, uh, 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 we, we, we started studies in seven African countries on intersectoral collaboration for SDGs. And then we found that it is the key to achieving SDGs which are uh, interlocked. So we started a model in one of the districts called Mora, and there now all those things which I have accelerated a little bit. Oh yeah, yeah, it's almost finished. Another five minutes. Uh, 
Uh, so we we have uh, uh, please because uh, yeah okay go ahead please Francis. Uh, uh, yeah so uh, this what i've told you is happening in the villages here now the uh, uh, utilization of health facilities is shot up so high and so and i think these are the results here you can see for yourself a year ago uh, uh, september uh, last year and september now the september now is in red you can see how much better they have performed uh, just because of this intervention alone. And these are uh, the outcomes which we expect, mobilized communities, taking charge, and this whole of society approach. It also deals with conflicts in the village. If there is conflict over land or property or uh, other issues, uh, uh, they, they, these same people are the ones who deal with them. So, it introduces stability. One of the villages has called their program peace. And what about Africa? What does this mean for Africa? To me, the single most important thing we should do now to achieve SDGs on time is to engage communities and empower communities and introduce people-centered, people uh, uh, integrated people-centered community uh, 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 health services not just community health workers, but community health services which are owned and led by all of society, including government leaders. Uh, and of course, re-intersectoral communication, empower the people, that will also increase, increase the uh, uh, demand and um, also set standards for each level of the health system, use data, above all, strengthen leadership and governance of our health systems and human resources for health. We know all this. The problem is we are not doing it. There is a sense of urgency. The crisis like of COVID is real. And my message is to inspire each one of us, wherever we are, to get on and do something in person. Here in Uganda, I'm the chair of the uh, community engagement strategy of the National COVID Task Force. And that is my contribution. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much, uh, Francis, uh, for sharing your very rich experience. Congratulations again for the uh, Noguchi Award. I'm sorry I couldn't be there because of the circumstances uh, last year. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think we, uh, the, the next speaker will kind of try to implement what you're saying. And so thank you again. Well, the later, the suivant, um, the next speaker is the very explanation of what the Professor Nyanga said already. It is the uh, commitment of people that have uh, were that have lived with COVID-19 is very, very important. The engagement is very important. As many participants, I am here to uh i live in a country where there is a lot of uh, hiv patients and they and they have a very important role and so i would like uh, this is the uh, former minister of culture of senegal that have suffered from covid 19 uh, as myself actually i have uh, needed months to actually uh, feel back like myself um your uh, evolution was favorable after being hospitalized in uh, intensive care for more than three weeks. Can you share with us your uh, experience and what are the recommendations that you can make towards uh, decision makers, the population, and uh, also for vulnerable patients in five minutes, if possible, really? Thank you. You have the floor. Mr. the Minister, your microphone is uh, muted. Could you please turn it on? Bonjour. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. I am really sorry. So good morning, all. I would like to, first of all, uh, 
commend the professor Awamai Konseke, Ibrahim Asek, who have uh, made me uh, participate to such a session with uh, such eminent uh, people. I will try to uh, not be shy, to overcome my shyness, to talk about my experience as a COVID-19 uh, patient. First of all, the first thing that I would like to tell you is that uh, it sometimes happens to you when you least expect it. I was uh, uh, the people that did not really believe about, uh, that was quite skeptical about the disease. I had taken my precaution. I would wear my mask and uh, wash my hands often. But one day I was in a family ceremony and this is where I contracted the virus that was confirmed by three other cases in the same family in the same circumstances. My experience with COVID-19, I was uh, detected because I fainted twice in a row and following these, I was uh, first sent to a cardiologist to look at why, the reason why I was fainting. First of all, I thought I had a arrhythmia. And since I, uh, I already fainted twice, we wanted to avoid a third one that could have been uh, fatal for me. So they decided to uh, give me a pacemaker. Uh, it is uh, before the analysis that the radiologue so uh, something on my lungs and he was quite worried about about it. So I was tested for uh, COVID and I was positive. After that, I went from being a normal uh, uh, patient to becoming an exceptional uh, patient. I was in the hospital Aristide-Dontec of Dakar and it uh, it is for me the time uh, the opportunity to commend the professionalism of the whole medical uh, chain of senegal they have been uh, very quick in their response but also very committed and creative and innovative uh, and it was really multi-sectoral because i am uh, i have diabetes i am 64 years old i have other um, heart diseases and I do not really exercise much. Well, at least I didn't exercise much, but I've changed now. And so I was what they called a, a risk uh, patient and a vulnerable uh, patient. So when I was in the Aristide Dantec hospital where I was in perfect condition, I'd say, I was taken care of by the center and treatment started right away. But it is when the treatment uh, started that I realized that I was actually sick, you know? It is at that very moment that my uh, lungs, I think, were uh, affected and that my uh, respiratory disease, uh, distress led me to some form of asphyxia for uh, two to three days. Uh, it is thanks to the uh, the help of the doctors and their quick reac reaction that I was able to come back. Uh, but for some days, I was in a very, very severe and dire state up until I needed uh, help breathing because I had to, they had to care, take care of me as a COVID patient, but also of my diabetes uh, medication because my diabetes was uh, unbalanced because I, I was taking too much corticoid. And all of it was also uh, accompanied by a, a loss of weight. So they had to balance everything. So myself, I, as I said, I have diabetes, I had uh, problems with my lungs, heart disease, and then I ended up with kinesi therapy because after all these tre treatments, I had to learn how to uh, talk again, so I needed physical therapy. Uh, I had issues talking, is, is issues walking. I had to learn how to walk again as well 
and even how to breathe again. And this period uh, that uh, of uh, this uh, period where I had to come back, I was back at home because I was declared a negative, but I couldn't go, for example, during my recovery period to go from my room to the toilet because I had difficulties working walking. So what I can say is that this disease is very real. When I said at the beginning that I was skeptical, I was saying, oh, it's been uh, made in uh, China to really threat uh, to really make us fierce. But it is a real disease that actually uh, hurts you. And if it's not taken care of early, then it can lead to fatal issues, to fatal um, consequences. So you have to be aware of that. The other message that I want is that this was a collective error, communication error that the uh, political authorities had at the beginning of the pandemic, at the international, but also at the national level. We have, uh, we played on uh, the, peer, the fear of people, but fear has its limit. And at a certain time, it becomes bravery at, this, at such a level that people thought uh, that ah, at this point, since there are no solution, we, we may as well die of something, so let's just keep living. And it is this distortion in communication, in my opinion, that we need to correct so that the population can understand that it is not just about making them fear uh, the disease, but it is important that they can understand the severity of the pandemic. I think the Professor Nyon has said it in his intervention already. There are some political, financial issues that the uh, people do not understand and can uh, interpret in a wrong way. So there is a strategy to take, uh, to put into place to say that there is a cost, everything has a cost, and life has no cost though. So people need to understand better the different me uh, world mechanism and to better accept, to pay the price uh, to live a better life. Uh, the lesson that myself I've learned from it is that we need uh, to have a, a healthier life. We need to understand that, for example, I'm 64 years old and I had to change my lifestyle. I exercise more, I eat uh, healthier by favoring uh, nutri uh, nutrients full of food, more healthy food, by favoring quality of a quantity, by uh, having long walks, and uh, by having a, a better uh, vision of life, perspective of life. I, I give more love uh, to my family because now I realize how important family is uh, because during this COVID-19 moments, everyone is uh, running away from you. You realize that you have less friends than you uh, thought because of stigmatization. Everyone, one way or another, is just, you know, withdrawing from you. And it is your family that is next to you that encourage you and that is ready to uh, share everything with you. This is my uh, experience. I didn't want to take too much time, so thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, thank you very much uh, to you, former minister, for this testimony. I would uh, like to really commend you for this. Thank you as well for the recommendations that you have made. Very useful recommendation. They have been noted down, but also for the messages that you've uh, given to the population and the communities so that they can uh, protect themselves. So this is the last intervention, this fourth intervention rather, excuse me, that is going to uh, put an end to our first theme on multi-sectoral and community participation, strength, weakness, and recommendation. We can now look into the second theme uh, on contribution of traditional medicine in the response against COVID-19, state of play, challenges, and prospects. We have three professors here that will intervene. I'll start with the Professor Rukia 
Rokia Sanogo, head of the traditional medicine department of the National Institute of Public Health of Mali and vice president of the advisory committee on traditional medicine for the WHO. Uh, professor, could you please uh, look at the uh, improvement of uh, traditional medicine in prevention in the context of COVID-19, please, in five minutes. Professor, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you for uh, this question, and I would like to uh, thank the team of the of, uh, Gallian Forum Africa to have associated me to this uh, session, and I would like to really congratulate the Professor Awakolsek and the Professor Emmanuel Bassen, my master, with uh, whom I will intervene in this session, and the Professor Alain as well. As the vice president of the committee expert of the WHO for traditional med medicine in the response against COVID-19, I was very happy to listen to Professor Nyang that was saying that we need to listen to communities. And I believe that it is very important uh, to listen to our communities. This will bring us elements of traditional uh, medicine and it is in this within this framework that i would like to commend the uh, the um, setting up of this committee of experts uh, at the who and it was the uh, opportunity to really create a link between what is happening on the ground and the who because there are many experience from our countries that are not really uh, made visible. So when this committee was set up, the first activities that were carried out were to take a look at the different studies that were ongoing on traditional medicine to adopt a, a roadmap and also to adopt the different protocol that will allow us to assess the uh, efficiency, the safety, and the quality of the product uh, from Pharmacopia. Then uh, there was a sharing of experience uh, with the different countries, the approach that the countries have used to uh, use a certain number of products and preparation from uh, the uh, pharma copia that are already used in the fight against uh, viral diseases. So this is how we saw a mobilization, community mobilization of the different uh, practitioner of the centers with collaboration with the mm, traditional medicine centers, the department of uh, traditional medicine and the universities. This is how we were able to uh, have a, report, uh, a database of uh, plants that have antiviral proprieties and that can intervene in uh, reducing certain symptoms associated with COVID-19. Les inflammations, mais également l'atout, les difficultés respiratoires. C'est difficulties in breathing, and uh, that is how a number of drugs, what which we call traditional medicine, have been developed. To be submitted for investigation. That is how throughout Africa today, the WHO has, Secretary of the WHO has identified that there are clinical tests, phase one and phase two across Africa, 
we under pay, observation uh, studies, eight African countries today are carrying out clinical tests, phase one, de la on Deux, products sont en train from de faire African pharmacopoeia. Two sont en train are de being des observed, des while eight deux. are on va pas dans les détails, on phase two mais clinical trials. We we'll get into the details, quoi, but the WHO has not yet come up with a list of work donc, which is ongoing pour cela, in traditional medicine in Africa. Ça, au début de la COVID, tout le monde a écouté All of this, de ces people have heard about the experience avec un of this patient who had a positive result apivirine. with a product Et called apivirine. And uh, this was produced in Benin Republic and is already being used in the treatment of HIV. And there is a number of protocols in West Africa to try to du Mali, see how that can be used. In Mali, for instance, on a we propose des tisanes, des tisanes qui sont we déjà utilisées dans les hepatites uh, virales, roots which are already being used in rural areas, as tea, and which have medicinal powers, and uh, which have been validated in their past in, against viral infections, and these roots have uh, power to cure cough, inflammations, and Mali. Uh, Nous avons mis à la disposition des femmes de prise en charge de la COVID une touche uh, COVID-19, un siro qu'on appelle le siro balimbo, qui est issu de la pharmacopée que nous avons proposée pour la prise en charge de uh, la tout sèche associée à la COVID. Of dry cough, Donc, which is associated to COVID -19. avec le meeting que so, le comité a eu à la fin de l'octobre, nous trouvons qu'il y a un certain nombre de résultats encourageants pour les premiers décès. Nous trouvons qu'il y a un certain nombre de résultats for the first tests which have been made at the WHO within the framework of the committee is preparing to carry out uh, further uh, research on a number of products, but also products for cough as well as uh, COVID-19. So I want to say that it is very important to be aware of the two aspects. Le niveau communication des tradis praticiens pour la sensibilisation, l'information uh, et l'orientation, mais également l'offre de soins, des tisanes qui uh, sont proposées. Il y a beaucoup de patients COVID qui ne vont pas dans le centre de santé parce que Many vous avez parlé au COVID début de la stigmatisation. Donc, il s'agit pour nous aujourd'hui de faire en sorte qu'on puisse documenter le recours des populations aux tisanes, aux préparations issues de la pharmacopie. Donc, en perspective, en perspective, nous pensons, et également un autre élément de réflexion que nous devons faire, en quoi La pharmacopée et la médecine traditionnelle, traditional, en quoi les tisanes uh, proposées par les tradis pratiques ou de l'expérience même des populations, en quoi ces tisanes uh, ont contribué à uh, limiter la population, how has it contributed in limiting Ça, the propagation of this COVID-19 within the community? That is a, an issue we should be discussed. So in terms of prospects, I believe that it is important today to uh, affect Funds for research for those who are working in the area of uh, traditional treatment to strengthen research and development to validate the use of these uh, rules or other forms to complete the investigations which are ongoing in terms of recommendations. We believe that uh, today this pandemic is indeed an opportunity which pour cela, we il va should defeat, but to defeat this pandemic, Africa will need to work together, together because uh, traditional medicine and pharmacopoeia are part of the Moi, African heritage, and uh, I said it, and Professor Inyang also said it, Et la médecine traditionnelle est notre patrimoine traditionnel médecine is our et je crois que nous devons y faire le coup pour la santé et pour l'avenir 
parce que nous devons faire en sorte que désormais l'Afrique institue des programmes durables, pas circonstanciels, pas événementiels, des programmes durables. Et je crois que l'OMS et l'Union africaine, avec la mise en place de ce comité, pourront instituer ce programme durable. Et je crois que le Forum Galien Afrique qui a and, uh, forum, institué uh, de parler de la médecine traditionnelle de la pharmacopée uh, ensemble, je crois que nous pourrons instituer cela pour que uh, les ressources de la pharmacopée et la médecine problem. traditionnelle puissent so contribuer à lutter contre les maladies émergentes et réémergentes mais que l'Afrique apporte sa solution et l'Afrique pourra avoir une couverture sanitaire pour la couverture sanitaire in the continent. That is what I wanted to say, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sanogo, for this uh, different dimension of what we're talking about. Now, I'll give the floor to Professor Bassini, Manuel Bassin, who is a uh, a holder for a degree in traditional uh, medicine and pharmacopoeia in the Ministry of uh, Health and Social Action in Senegal. So, could you just uh, tell us the contribution of traditional medicine in uh, caring for patients who, who are infected with the COVID-19 pandemic in Senegal and the challenge which you've been able to face up till now? Thank you very much, Professor. For your contribution. Thank you, it's Professor Piot. I would first of all uh, express my uh, greetings to all those who are present and the representative of the Minister of Health of uh, Senegal, Mr. Beng. After the earlier speakers, let me also participate in the reflection. I would first of all want to say that the African system, especially in West Africa, was more or less ready to face this pandemic because the systems are endowed with, with structures in communities through preventive services in the Ministry of Health. And uh, this service indeed uh, was, uh, was, was motivated and strengthened at the level of uh, the borders and at the communal level. Communities themselves were organized. They, we have the Bajenogo and all these systems were indeed prepared to deal with this uh, new pandemic. And of course, as it wasn't a surprise, it was necessary to adapt and to be vigilant to deal with it. I'm going to talk along the same lines as Professor Nyan and Professor Maswat, I'll say in English. The fear relating to confinement and this state of emergency uh, turned out to be a, a storm in a teacup. And uh, by making it possible those who have as a heritage can uh, see exactly what was uh, going on. Now the community, the entire community was already armed to face this pandemic. They had some way of fighting this uh, pandemic. So we believe that uh, Africa Africa is a continent 
which uh, is believed not to have sufficient medication to deal with the multiple attacks from microbes and viruses. Because uh, uh, you will understand that uh, there's flu in uh, Europe during uh, winter. And all of that uh, we used to have in Africa also. So we can say that that, that pandemic was already there. And we could say that uh, there was already resistance to that uh, uh, flu because uh, it was already existing in certain parts of uh, our country. So the country was already ready to deal with this, this uh, flu. In uh, Senegal, there was the issue of mobilization. People were quickly mobilized with traditional healers and uh, communal stakeholders. Even in big cities like Bajanogo, which was established in the year 2000. So all of this put together make it possible to quickly spread amongst the people in the uh, community, the need for social distancing, restrictions, the wearing of masks. Of course, the masks were expensive from the onset, but people were able to wear their masks and people limited their movements, they limited the number of meetings which were taking place. And all of this was brought to the knowledge of the community thanks to these traditional healers. I don't want to take much of your time, but the participation of the contribution of traditional medicine was done without a lot of noise because we really don't have any information to assess this. And uh, you'll see that uh, the cases which did not go to the hospital were dealt with very quickly by communal action through uh, use of uh, roots and everything that could be used to help our body to defend our body system to defend itself and to fight against infections. It is indeed uh, a prospect which uh, we are going to talk about. And as some said, we should be systematic. What the WHO recommends may not necessarily be the solution all the time. In other words, we should go back to our roots and try to see how we can rely on our uh, capacities. Of course, we should work with our partners to develop uh, medical plans is in the interest of all. So I do not quite see, for instance, how we could take a timazine or its uh, derivatives and say that uh, that it should be avoided. So the message should be put differently to enable people to better understand the information and believe in the information which has been given to them. So the professor said a while ago, some of these pre-clinics have been used but they were not, they were not very much recognized and there was no clear policy on the use of uh, medicinal plants and uh, on the use of uh, traditional medicine. So it is important for both of them to be used together because we cannot exclude what uh, researchers in the university are doing and at the same time, we cannot exclude what is being done at the level of the community in terms of uh, traditional medicine. So that is my message. And uh, that's, this will lead to discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bassin, for this uh, presentation. We would like to express satisfaction with what you are doing in the field of uh, traditional medicine in the Ministry of uh, Health and uh, Social Affairs. Now we're going to call on Professor Sakuba, who is a neurologist and part, a member of the African Committee of uh, Traditional Healers. He's from Madagascar. Professor, now as a neurologist and member of the African Regional Group, can you share with us your experience and especially 
the difficulties which uh, you had to face. It's uh, practically the same question we've put to the others. So please, we await your response and you have five minutes. Professor, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Chair, permit me first of all to subscribe to uh, appreciations, thanks, and congratulating all those who spoke before me. That is, all those who have uh, contributed from far or near to the success of this state Galilean Forum. Permit me also to respond to your question. Indeed, as a doctor in hospital, of course, in the face of this uh, epidemic, there are measures to be taken because it's a new illness. And uh, when we try to refer to our colleagues, our European colleagues, they don't agree on what should be the best treatment. And when we try to look a little bit further in the Americas, in such a context, we notice that we had to, we discovered that we're dealing with one of the greatest pandemics in Madagascar. That is, we decided that we had to deal with COVID, that's organic COVID. This is a local product produced from Artemisia. It was proposed to us by the Ministry of Health in the number of uh, drugs used in the treatment. It is an unknown illness and there was no known treatment. So we already have the experience of using uh, plant medicine in our country for years now. And we have many me medications which are proposed in the treatment of all sorts of uh, illnesses. But we had reference treatment in other countries, which made it possible for us to follow up with what is proposed to us as drugs uh, for tradi local traditional treatment, and which it finally made it possible for us to uh, know what to do where we fail to succeed. So it was important for us to uh, face the situation as it was because we did, couldn't find any better solution from anywhere. And that is how the flux of uh, sick people came in and we tried as much as possible to look from a different perspective of this traditional medicine. And I would like to talk about traditional medicine practice because in our country, we have learned and we have tried to deal with illnesses through the fight against epidemics, especially COVID-19. Finally, we discovered that the manner in which our traditional healers were dealing with COVID-19 was indeed a source of inspiration for modern therapy in the fight against incurable diseases because we did not meet any traditional healer who did not practice holy therapy. And today, you know that in medicine, in ultra modern medicine, all that is done when one is dealing with uh, incurable or difficult illnesses to deal with, you don't use holy therapy. So all viral diseases and all the major fights which medicine has won against uh, viruses is through polytherapy. So our traditional healers practice this polytherapy and they've been doing so since the ice age. And therefore we should try to go a little bit further in this experience. So this polytherapy which they practice also has other competitive advantages in 
comparison to modern medicine because it is already based to uh, past achievements. So today we can convince people to take these traditional medicines. You can look at the struggle in the production of vaccines today. Now, what are traditional healers doing? They want people to accept their products. And that was the case with COVID here in Madagascar. You, we saw people queuing up and we ourselves as doctors in hospital, we had uh, problems with the medication we were proposing to sick people, sick people. So this is an achievement of traditional medicine and these are products which are indeed accepted through a scientific practice. The problems faced amongst the population is the fact that uh, the prices are reasonable because all modern medication are very expensive and just too expensive for us. So we found that research research in Africa could indeed contribute in the fight against incurable diseases. Perhaps it is the most accessible means right now, this uh, traditional means of treatment, because we have a lot of uh, very many traditional healers. We have our local experts and the flora and fauna could be developed. The flora and fauna are available on the entire continent. I would want to say also that if we could indeed uh, develop this into an agro-industrial area, it would be very important for the regional economies of Africa, you can imagine. So it would be an economic sector which would which could indeed be adapted to our needs and would be adapted to our capacities and it will also be an investment. So I think of Afro champions, we have universities, Professor Rokia, for instance, has just uh, made an inventory of this and he has talked about uh, experts who can indeed uh, deal with COVID. I had the opportunity to participate in that meeting and I now know that we have the necessary laboratories, the capacity to produce the production units, the capacity to valorize. So Africa has indeed a, a proper standard. We can valorize and standardize our products and uh, when it comes to marketing, there's the African common market, which has just uh, started. And in short, we can say that perhaps we, perhaps we have to go through these uh, traditional practices and do something for ourselves, not only for COVID-19, because it could be extended to all other illnesses which are considered to be incurable, because the concept of all treatment, as I wanted to say, is polytherapy. And perhaps we uh, perhaps we should extend this approach to all these other illnesses. I hope that uh, we are all going to abide by this and that uh, the future commissioners of the African Union, future heads of state, will be champions to promote uh, traditional uh, healing. And uh, WHO Africa should uh, initiate something which could be controlled to deal with these aspirations. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. And indeed, it's another perspective for me, um, uh, for a neurologist. I believe that uh, this could be a real perspective. Thank you very much. Now, we will move to a completely different uh, dimension after this very rich contributions on traditional medicine. And uh, we'll be looking at the uh, supply chain of uh, medication in the fight against COVID-19 in Africa. Uh, we'll also look at the uh, challenges and uh, prospects. Uh, Dr. Alassane Ba. Uh, he's a director of uh, the Center for for the U U Humanitarian Center for uh, Professions in the Pharmaceutical Field. So there are some European states 
who uh, have uh, taken it uh, did it to supply the African market with uh, uh, medication to fight the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Can you share the uh, actions of your health center and make recommendations to deal with this type of uh, situation in the local production of uh, medication in Africa? If possible, you can do that in five minutes. You have the floor. Uh, good uh, afternoon, Professor, and thank you very much. Of course, I am very much, uh, very, very happy to be part of this uh, panel, but uh, also I'm happy to be able to talk uh, beside my sister and uh, an exec. And so permit me to talk about the impact of these decisions and what should be done and what is being done. And I will just want to talk about the complexity of the health situation which we are working on right now. Why is it complex? Because it is a health uh, product for the public which and states have to ensure that this product should be accessible to everybody regardless of where the people are found and regardless of their financial capacity. And it's also an economic product because it's a product which is industrial and uh, there is a desire of course to make a profit by the manufacturers and it's an industrial product and uh, it uh, needs to be uh, fabricated in huge quantities so it of course it's an economic uh, product and uh, this vaccines uh, there's uh, quite often we there's blackmail and uh, a country which produces a medication could say i will not share the medication with you and so this uh, country which is uh, seeking the medication will be in a position of weakness so these are some of the weaknesses i'm talking about so now when i have to talk about the impact of uh, covid and what we did and what I think our country should do. Now, contrary to what has been said from the onset, we did not have sufficient stocks at the beginning because a country like Benin had to organize to have sufficient stocks of medication. But the first impact was uh, the fact that uh, there were lots of fake drugs. We had a lot of fake drugs and the impact was that the impact was that uh, we have problems here in the speaker. We there are slight interruptions, but we'll try to follow. So, so as a matter of fact, it was important to uh, look, try to assess uh, the needs and assess the stock. And as you are aware, we have to ensure that the quality was uh, appropriate. And this was indeed the impact of uh, COVID-19. So what did we do? And that could be interesting too. The very first thing which we did with the organization is that we set up what we called a follow-up and monitoring system. It was this regional mechanism with uh, laboratories, which you may call, which you may say, were to serve as a bulwark against the uh, expansion of this uh, pandemic. And we set up an air link to ensure that the products were carried to countries which faced risk. For instance, countries at war and remote areas uh, like in Mali or in Sudan. And uh, so we, uh, to, uh, we have a recycling method so that the products are not toxic for patients anymore. So whether they are funding with the IMF, uh, the World Bank and so on. 
Now, when it comes to a recommendation, because I don't have a lot of time, I want just I just want you to say that before talking about recommendation, if we look at products that we use uh, ourselves, a hundred percent of. Uh, if China is in lockdown and then we uh, they cannot uh, manufacture, we do not have any more paracetamol, for example. And uh, in its plan made in China, China will become the first exporting countries country. Uh, however, today we see when it comes to a uh, strategic change where uh, Europe is trying to relocate its uh, pharmaceutical production. Countries have uh, gathered to try and uh, and create a market to distribute uh, medicine and drugs. Now the question is, what about Africa, where 90% of the um, medicine we consume is imported? We are in a strategy of economic war, and as I was saying already, there has been a, a sort of um, so it's important that we take we put into place a production unit. Uh, we have to remember that uh, it is a uh, finite project. If you do not have uh, excellent centers that uh, produce the uh, raw material and everything, we have the equipment, but we'll never be able to be autonomous. And uh, when it comes to uh, pharmaceuticals, so what I really recommend myself, and I don't think I am the only one. Since we work I, as a thematic group financed by the World Bank that look at independent uh, pharmaceutical strategies, uh, what can we do so that uh, the patient can have access to uh, medicine with less than a dollar per day? What we want is uh, excellence poll, meaning that a country has capacity to uh, f uh, fabricate uh, raw materials. Some uh, Another country that has the capacity to have the equipment Another one that can transfer technology, because if you have the equipment, you have conditioning uh, tools, and you also have the raw material, but you don't have the equipment, then you'll still be dependent. So we want to uh, really get rid of all the point where uh, we'll still be dependent. So we need together to have all the levers that will allow us to be autonomous. To, uh, to be able to manufacture some uh, drugs and medicine. It's been seen in some countries, they've had been manufacturing unit, and we've, we thought about the final product, but not of all the levers I've just mentioned. And after two, three years, because the uh, plant was dependent on raw material and equipment, it's a problem. So we want excellence poll at the level of our country, of French speaking countries, Will maybe a uh, technology uh, transfer with uh, the uh, with North Africa, and to end my speech, if we are not no longer dependent, if we have a, a raw material excellence poll, a raw material uh, equipment uh, poll excellence, a raw material um, and now human resources poll excellence poll as well, and if we have all of this, we'll be able to reunite to unite all the conditions to be able to have a uh, the condition to manufacture our own medicine and drugs. Uh, I'm trying to be brief, but what is important here is this notion of uh, independence, a pharmaceutical independence, using all the levers I've just cited. Thank you. Uh, we would like to thank you, Dr. Ba the actions of your centers, uh, of your center, and the recommendation that you've uh, formulated. I uh, would like to introduce now the uh, Dr. Annette Sengai, Director of the National Pharmacy of Supply in Senegal. First of all, I would like to congratulate her for the work that she's uh, been doing. Uh, you've put into place uh, strategies for uh, a pharmaceutical supply that has had a great success. However, you've had some difficulties to get supplies uh, and to be able to manage uh, the uh, donation uh, with this pandemic of COVID-19. 
Uh, can you explain to us your strategy when it comes to supply, and especially in this crisis? Thank you, uh, Secretary General, for giving me the floor. Mr. Mbang, I would like to uh, first of all talk to you. I was commend the co-chair, and uh, I would like to uh, to say that I followed Dr. Ba, with whom we've been working quite a lot on these questions. My experience as the national pharmacy for supply, the uh, COVID has really highlighted the uh, weaknesses of our supply chain. First of all, an unbalance with the fact that once again, we depend, Africa depend on importation. Uh, apart from North Africa. Now, there is no collaboration on sub in, with, with, between Sub-Saharan Africa and Northern African countries that are way ahead of us in a way. With an importation almost uh, turned there towards Asia and Europe. And uh, there is another another observation that was made as it was said this relocation of some sectors of pharmaceutical industry towards asia that shows that highlights giants with clay feet that showed straight away their weaknesses from uh, the onset of COVID-19 and the closing of borders. Now, also, another observation when it comes to the supply chain, very complicated supply chain that are fragmented with fa uh, manufacturing site on one con continent, quality control on another continent, and distributors in another. There is also the weakness, the uh, poor uh, production uh, capacity, of uh, main site in Africa, where we have two uh, manufacturers, Af uh, South Africa and Tanzania. And as is what says by Dr. Ba, these multinationals in uh, Europe import more than 80% of their uh, raw materials, and they realize that their uh, production capacity has decreased quite a lot. This crisis, Mr. President, was brutal with a, a propag propagation of uh, a rapid propagation of the virus, a reduction of mobility, a decrease of importation. And that is what said by uh, the co-chair, Professor Piot, restrictive measures. People wanted the same product at the same time, and uh, therefore they all locked themselves. Europe uh, locked herself in. China, same. India as well uh, has taken some restrictive measures, but as we know, it was still importing its raw material to China. So Africa, in a way, was alone facing its destiny, and I believe that uh, even in the darkest of hours, there is still light because this, the, the shortcut in supplies has, has highlighted the uh, resilience of our uh, health systems and of our supply chains in Africa. The increase of uh, consumption is a, sub a, a sudden change in the functioning of supply chain to be able to ourselves organize ourselves. And the secret of resilience, resilience here was the safety uh, stocks that were already in place in Senegal. It's been one of our uh, strengths and this capacity as well to try and uh, have uh, uh, exchange in Africa. And I'll come back to the difficulties uh, on this. In the whole world, another lesson was the change in prices. 
We talked about businesses. We we weren't talking about health anymore, public health. We went from a thousand and three hundred uh, CFA franc for mask to twenty five thousand with so many uh, middlemen uh, and an increase of prices. And as Mr. Uh, Dr. Bass said, in uh, counterfeit uh, appearing for uh, um, diseases, but also for PPE. With a, uh, an unbalance and a risk of having uh, lower quality products. And so a particular attention uh, to be put on Africa so that we wouldn't be the uh, dumpster. The uh, the challenges were many. We needed a uh, access to all the countries, but we also need approaches, innovative approaches, for a coherent supply with a more and more unstable market. We also had to uh, strengthen this dynamic, this integration integration dynamic for local production, uh, because at a certain point, and especially at the regional and sub-regional level, we realized that we had capacities, yes, uh, but in we still had some capacities. However, distribution channels were so weak and infrastructure same that as an example I can say for example that to bring uh, produce, products from Mali we needed a week even uh, by road so here as well those are uh, challenges we've been facing and I believe that those are lessons to be uh, learned we talked about pharmacopoeia and traditional medicine We've seen that in countries, pr products and traditional medicine were used, and now you're there. There, they are not being questioned anymore. However, um, distribution channels were uh, absent, and all the uh, initiative were local and weren't distributed in the different distribution the large scale distribution channel and this is also a lesson to be learned the national authorities have been overwhelmed because they had to change the different supply chain channels as well as changing uh, suppliers uh, asking for approval uh, when it came to importation imports and it was really difficult and there as well there have been some challenges another challenge has been quality control you know that in africa we have uh, we do not have a lot of in our centers we uh, were uh, we had some difficulties given the uh, close the uh, shortcomings of some products storing capacity have uh, been problematic as well as the president bank has said there's been so many donation which led to coordination uh, problem these donation weren't uh, done by taking into account the needs of the countries but standardized uh, were Uh, and they haven't been able to take into account the uh, taking into account the individual needs of each country. As perspective, uh, Africa has to uh, put into place a more assertive leadership and uh, coordinated intervention of all actors a uh, will a political will a strong political will but also a commitment of all countries to be able to really elaborate uh, investment plan and but also to be able to mobilize fund uh, we need to go through uh, concerted uh, approaches so that we can make the national supply system uh, more sustainable, that together we work 
uh, with uh, local production capacity that countries do not do the same, but that countries can work together in community areas and that they can work together and that we have a manufacturing unit that are uh, feasible, that the areas in Africa are more dynamic and that the exchange areas in Africa are more dynamic and that we can promote the uh, trade in inter-African uh, region. A priority to development research as well so that we can highlight our traditional medicine plant, uh, the use of plants, and also uh, the setting up of infrastructure, uh, road infrastructure, airports that can be f that can be useful to facilitate exchanges. We cannot to go to Rwanda, go through many countries, and therefore have 15 to 20 days delays to uh, trade uh, products between countries. We also need to leverage and take advantage of the digital revolution and improve the access to the internet. COVID-19 has showed us that we needed the internet, a stable internet connection. Exchanges uh, discussion were virtual and it was therefore paramount uh, for the rapid actions to be taken. And I would like to finish on saying that Africa should today show its, uh, the secrets of its resilience, the uh, strength of its uh, health system and of its supply chain to ensure that we can uh, ensure these changes and structural uh, transformation so that we can have sovereignty in uh, the pharmaceutical sector to seize the many opportunities to take advantage of innovation, but also the emergence of new talents. COVID-19 has showed that we were able uh, by ourselves for ourselves to do a certain amount of things, uh, ventilators, masks, and so on and so forth, and therefore having a, uh, a equitable uh, and sustainable Africa. I would like to say uh, that another Africa is possible. It's not only a uh, utopia. History is looking at us. Thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ndiaye. In another Africa is possible. I like what you've just said, your last message to everyone. And I think that it is already done. As a last speaker, uh, the last but not least, that is said from Morocco, the professor Mohamed Khaled Shuli, that is at the head of the Department of Preclinical Sciences and manager of large social organization in Morocco. Morocco ensures 60% of the um, drugs needs of its population at the moment, and this is quite unique. Can you uh, share with us a strategic strategies and uh, challenges of a uh, perform of an effective uh, supply chain and especially in the context of the COVID-19. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Can you all hear me correctly? Yes, yes, we can hear you perfectly. No, I can't see, uh, I can't see your screen being shared. I'll just share it uh, in a minute, please. Thank you. Yes, it's working now. Thank you. Can you see that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you to my friend Ibrahim Asek that has associated me to this very extraordinary ex ex um, forum. And it is with the uh, organization. I know it's not really easy. you know, with this uh, digital uh, use, but also I think that the uh, speakers are of such quality that I would like to thank the organizer. It's really a success and it's always a pleasure for me to be here uh, after Marrakech, Dakar is my uh, second city of choice and it's always a great pleasure to participate with my friend of Dakar.
have heard the contribution of the Dr. Annette Sek, and I agree with her, another Africa is indeed possible. And as a uh, professor at the um, Medical School of Marrakesh, but as well uh, the president of Yenda, an NGO that uh, we group all the students in medicine and pharmacy, uh, throughout Morocco, we have a human capital that is absolutely extraordinary and that should change things in Africa and make of our continent a continent of possibilities. You are right through the contribution of uh, Dr. Alassane and of Dr. Annette. Yes, indeed, the uh, difficulties are uh, huge when it comes to our supply chain and through um, globalization, the crisis has shown once again that we have difficulties because the world is the, is interconnected, of course, and so supply, change are, supply chains are uh, linked, interlinked. We have given examples, whether through the very simple example of paracetamol in China and other examples as well. So today our continent is suffering, whether with uh, reagent or some drugs, our uh, continent is suffering. And the crisis has shown it with the closing of uh, borders, national borders, uh, that COVID has uh, created a big disturbance, disturbance unprecedented that has impacted the supply chains in this period. But at the same time, this crisis for ourselves, for myself, is an opportunity to really look at our governance uh, model in our on our continent. And you're right, Dr. Anna, to say that coordination today leadership coordination today in Africa as really uh, to look back at governance and on many aspects, not only for uh, the uh, medicine and drugs, but also uh, for uh, food in general. You are completely right. We need to look back at it. We are here in this, uh, facing this, whether uh, biomedical material, you've uh, given concrete examples, I will not come back to those, uh, and to your diagnostic. And I think this uh, asks the fundamental question of national sovereignty when it comes to international health problem issues, and it's not a new question. I think that a lot of uh, international thinkers, and you have Sankale, Mark Sankal, uh, in 1961 has already had already touched upon it, uh, the question of national sovereignty. And I think this is a, a big problem, a huge problem. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we are n still not able. Uh, and it, it is high time through this crisis that shows us our weaknesses, that coordination, collaboration, inter-African collaboration uh, takes things more seriously. We have a, a human potential that is absolutely e extraordinary through researchers, students, and we do not have to envy anyone. Uh, countries where crises were more important, where uh, African resilience was absolutely extraordinary, and I think that it is high time that we start uh, really taking this question uh, seriously or more seriously, whether it is about food security, uh, health security, or even the uh, security uh, after uh, technical and uh, there have been uh, things that have been shown uh, through uh, traditional medicine, the use of plants. Uh, we need really in Africa to be careful to look at this triangle of food security and 
of the information, technical, uh, technical, medical information of our uh, really heritage that will allow us to really look at this question of sovereignty in general. Uh, really quickly to give you an example of how Morocco reacted, as you all know, today I would like to give you uh, some statistics. Um, the, we are one of the countries in Africa, in Northern Africa at least, that has uh, been really affected. We have had 388,000 cases with uh, more than 6,000, 6,427 deaths today. I would say that many uh, doctors have perished, unfortunately, nurses as well that uh, died during this uh, pandemic since March. Morocco has uh, really had issues uh, with this uh, pandemic, very important uh, number of cases that we've been dealing with, with a great resilience and determination. And I would like to cite uh, three faces. Excuse me, Professor. Uh, the session will be cut short in two minutes because there will be another session. Unfortunately, I'm the last one. Well, very uh, quickly on masks. The uh, Moroccan industry was able to readapt completely to uh, produce our own mask in Morocco. And I don't know if you remember the uh, world mask crisis around the uh, month of March, a April and May. Quite quickly, the Moroccan industry was able to really adapt and to produce our own mask. And today we are able to produce millions and millions of masks and uh, Morocco exports masks, which was very important when it comes to anticipating the crisis. As a second phase, we adopted really quickly, uh, thanks to a, a national committee, uh, when it comes to chloroquine, we decided rapidly to use it and honestly, this anticipation when it comes to its use, that, and first of all, it was available in our stocks at the central pharmacy, and it was uh, locally producible. And so it was a very important a strategic decision that allowed us to really, really uh, well manage the uh, crisis. For uh, when it comes to the uh, drugs use and the third phase, as you know, Morocco has once again anticipated, and uh, this week we've started to use a vaccine, and now they've decided to use the Chinese vaccine that we've imported, and this week, this very week, Morocco has started vaccinating against the virus with the Chinese vaccine, a decision that was very important to try and, you know, break the propagation chain of the epidemic that was very important in Morocco. If I have a, a message and a, it's a very, it's a pity because we do not have much time, but if I have a message as a professor, a university professor, I would say that our countries in Africa more than ever need to, fa to face scientific and technical world challenge. We have a human capital that is absolutely extraordinary, whether the students uh, in the institute, in schools, Our uh, experts, our teachers, this human capital, uh, extraordinary human capital, our uh, decision makers need to believe in it so uh, that we can really uh, lead, this can lead to sovereignty, not only for a uh, drug, but on other aspects on our development in general. We should work together through more collaboration 
so that this African continent can be a uh, possible Africa. Thank you. Pour qu'on puisse justement affronter cette question de la souveraineté, donc euh, pas en termes uniquement je veux dire, de médicaments, mais sur plusieurs aspects qui touchent notre développement de manière générale. Et je crois que nous avons intérêt à travailler ensemble, plus de coordination, plus de collaboration pour justement faire de, de ce continent africain un, vraiment une Afrique possible. Et merci. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Euh...